Um, as I said on Piazza, um, based on the poll that we had, uh, we're going to have an extended session from 245 to 315. Uh, you're not required to be there. I understand 70% of you said you want it. 30% of you said you actually have conflicts. I completely understand that people might have conflicts and they have to leave at uh, 2.45. Um, so what would happen, of course, is everything is being recorded. This too will be recorded. Let's just assume that this part is a required watching for the next class, which I'm allowed to do. Okay? Uh, I can't make you stay here when you have conflict. I don't want to. Uh, but on the other hand, since enough people are interested, um, then we're going to do it this way. This part, so essentially just have to make sure that the last 30 minutes of the class, if you have to leave, you should feel free to leave. I mean, you leave anyway in the middle of the class, that's fine too. But, uh, you know, you certainly should feel free to leave at 2.45. I know some of you actually have classes and stuff. Um, but um, I would be continuing until 3.15, and then that last 30 minutes. Basically, you should make up by watching it before coming to the next class. That shouldn't be too hard. That way, then we will all be on the same um, um, same page when we go to the next class. Okay. Um, okay. So, and then, by the way, I never actually quite understood. I, I did send this uh, this large chapter. Just a second. A large chapter, a long chapter of Ian Goodfellow that that Ian Goodfellow wrote for the Intro to AI textbook. Um, I'm assuming that all of you downloaded it and are reading it. Because much of this stuff and more is there, in some sense actually, um, part of what you guys voted for essentially is I will spend this week also on deep learning, which means that chapter is quite relevant. I won't still cover the full chapter, but I'll cover more of that chapter than ever gets covered in an intro to AI. In fact, as I said, most of the intro to AI classes will have at most one lecture on multi-layer neural networks. Um, and so uh, we are going to do more, obviously. OK, so I'm assuming that you're reading that. That's where all the readings are coming from. I'm not giving any separate readings. Um, but you know, sometimes I have given, like for example, last time I gave uh, some examples of uh, uh, the two, two, two uh, sites, actually one of which sort of does um, excruciating detail how to do the backdrop calculations. The other one which shows how uh, essentially on the computational graph backward propagation is basically automatic. Okay. Um, the textbook chapters, uh, in good fellows chapters sort of mentions it but doesn't spend as much time going into the specifics but it's worthwhile understanding in particular that second part that uh, so I put this today for a reason. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking of them. Everything that you take for granted was like new and shiny thing at some point of time in human civilization. And they would actually make a huge deal about it at that point of time. I don't know any of you know this, but when electricity, when electric bulbs were invented, People were like so crazy that you know on your Fifth Avenue, people will have lights on their heads and walking around. You know, you do it too some sometimes when you're slightly drunk in, in a concerts, but normally not. Okay, it's becomes like a whole home thing. Uh, we take them for granted. Okay, so similarly, in fact, one of the things that you almost have to take for granted um, is back propagation. The fact that if you define a network then the forward and the backward pass on the network can be essentially automatically done by some higher level programming language. That's what your tensor flows, etc. do. Okay, and once you realize that, you spend a lot of time trying to get to this point, you know, trying to figure out that back propagation is nothing but chain rule and that it can be done, etc., etc. But once you figure this out, then you put this. As computer scientists, we know how to put humongous amount of junk into one subroutine and just make a subroutine call. Okay, once we know that this can be done, you will see actually as we go forward that we start playing, basically we start assuming that anything can be made a parameter on the network and the trusty old gradient descent will learn it. 
It will take forever, just like it takes forever to you know, build a coral reef. It might take many, many efforts, but it will learn everything. In fact, one of the things that we'll talk about today is batch norm, which is essentially how to initialize weights, how to kind of renormalize weights in the neural network. And we'll notice that even that, we convert into a learning problem. So you are doing the normal learning, as well as learning how to normalize the inputs that are coming into different layers. It's like you're drunk on this crazy power that you can call the gradient descent, um, and you just get that. You know, you, it's not your problem anymore. I mean, it's your problem still in this class because you need to know how back propagation works. But from now onwards, we'll assume that you sort of got this underlying confidence that it will get taken care of so that we can build more things on top of it. That's exactly what Alfred Whitehead is saying. If you always had to think of differentiation by going back to limit h tends to 0 fx plus h minus fx by h, then you will basically never go anywhere. You have to understand it once, but then you have to build on uh, top of it. OK, yes, please. What? I already answered, wow. See, that's, I think that's the reason why I stop people most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very good predictor. I have a good neural network. Um, anyway, so that's that. And uh, by the way, um, OK, so we'll um, go forward um, on this. Um, so review a quick review of today's uh, last time. We saw multi-layer neural network, things like this. Uh, this is like the obvious. The simple architecture, there are other kinds of architectures you heard of. We will at least talk about one additional architecture, convolutional networks, because you know you kind of basically want to know about it. Um, and um, but you know, these are basically considered fully connected networks. So every node is connected to every other node in the forward direction. Um, so these are the multi-layer networks. You can, uh, uh, we saw the multi-layer networks, we saw how backpropagation works in principle. Um, you want to really think of multi-layer networks as this part plus this part. This will always be logistic perceptron if you're doing classifications. Okay, so what is happening between the init layer and this layer is the inputs are somehow being converted into a different space before being fed to your perceptron. And you know that that sort of a thing will help eventually because perceptron can only do linear uh, uh, separation. But you know that if you convert the initial inputs, you know, in arbitrary ways, for example, you say x1, x2, x1 square kind of changes. When you do that, they become obviously um, linearly separable. So you can imagine that whenever you see a linear neural network, in most cases, um, for, our, for our purposes, the last layer is just a logistic perceptron. And the guys before that are massaging the input in a way that logistic perceptron can take and draw a line. Do you see what I'm saying? That's way. And in fact, it's useful to understand that because when we get to convnets, we will basically replace this. We'll keep this the same, but we'll replace this into a completely different architecture, a convolutional architecture, um, which essentially does its own different way of extracting the features from the input, in essence. OK, and then but the last layer is still linear perceptor, logistic perceptor. Yes? We will talk about that. We will talk about that. OK. Right. Um, so that's one part. Uh, and then so with the, basically, you can think of the multi-layer nets as a bunch of layers extracting features from the input, with the last layer being the logistic perceptron, always. OK. And then we saw how backpropagation can be automated in terms of the backward pass on the computational graph. This is really the biggest contribution of computer science for this whole thing, the programming for this whole thing. Okay, because the moment you dig this, all hell breaks loose. Now basically people can write humongously large networks and say, it's not my problem. The machine will take care of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
And it, it opens up humongous amounts of flexibility. It also opens up lots and lots of problems. In fact, there is this very beautiful thing. Patrick Winston um, uh, is, as a guy who, uh, who was Ma Marvin Minsky's uh, first generation of students, he actually passed away recently. He's a very gifted teacher of AI at MIT, and he did some of the early work in AI. And one time when he gave this talk um, at uh, 1999 AI, he made this very interesting analogy that still sticks in my mind, that other engineering disciplines have upper bounds on what they can construct because of the natural limitations of the materials that they work with. Do you understand what I'm saying? I see that we have high, you know, high, um, high rises, you know, but you really don't expect towers that will be 355 stories tall. There is no material in the world that can support that kind of a structure. So in some sense, the material limitations put some discipline into the discipline. Okay, the discipline into that area. Computer scientists have no such worries. Do you see what I'm saying? You can write any number of lines of program. Now, the past, in the past, you wouldn't write big lines of program, typically because you, it's painful to write a program. Then we kept inventing all these high-level metaphors. You will write two lines of code, which becomes a million lines of assembly code. Right? Or you write two lines, somebody else writes two lines, then we copy them together and make a bigger code, and that becomes even bigger. And what we are doing right now, essentially, is a natural progression of that, where we just describe the network in this inter, you know, sort of an implicit fashion. It can have humongous number of trainable weights, and essentially, this entire structure is going to be learned. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so the limitations are much fewer in computer science because we take abstraction for granted. Okay, and that's exactly what Alfred Whitehead North was talking about. We are now abstracting the whole entire idea of doing back propagation um, on any random network. You just know that it can be automated. So then now you can start thinking, if I give you this you know, ability, what can you use it for? What are all the things else you can do? And that's what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of classes. Okay. Um, so in general, the, the reason backpropagation thing works really, um, uh, the automation of the backpropagation thing works really, um, is that um, um, a flaw in your network is just a huge function composed of other functions, and gradient computation involves using the chain rule, which can be done as the backward pass. So you define your high-level network architecture as, you know, in some language, and then the underlying software makes it both the code for the forward pass and the code for the backward pass. And then you go have a cup of coffee. Right? Um, OK, that's basically what's going to happen. That's basically what's being said. TensorFlow, et cetera, can generate backward and forward passes pretty much automatically once you specify the architecture of the network, which has reduced the amount of time people take that the barrier of entry has been reduced. So everybody can say, we are machine learners, we are deep learners, because we know how to switch on the computer, and then stuff happens, OK? Um, so now we want to figure out how actually this stuff works, more of how actually the stuff works. Um, in particular, we talked about gradient descent, and it makes these little, little, little points, and then you stop at some point of time. You have to stop at some point of time. When do you stop? The last time around when we talked about value iteration, we said we'll make value iteration updates, update, updates. We have to stop at some point of time. When do you stop? We had an idea there. We connected, we compared the value uh, vector from the kth iteration to the value vector from the k minus 1 iteration. You took the difference vector. You took the max norm of the difference vector. What is the max norm of a vector? It's basically the coefficient that has the highest value. Okay, and you said that should be less than, the absolute value of that should be less than or equal to epsilon, which is a threshold that you made up. And when that happens, you say, I will stop. That was your termination criterion. I want to know what is the termination criterion for 
gradient descent in neural networks. Now the interesting thing is that we came into neural networks in this strange way just so that because you wanted to hear about it as soon as you can, right? Um, but really, neural networks and uh, you know, deep learning, etc., are part of machine learning. In general, there's a huge amount of theory of how to do machine learning. And much of the first part of today's class would have to draw some of the background on machine learning itself, that machine learning problem itself, and then see how it connects to the machine learning in the context of neural networks as the form of the function that you're learning. Um, we will, at some point of time during this course, look at other kinds of functions that you could have learned, such as a decision tree, which doesn't look at all like a neural network. And we can also learn a Bayesian network, which is a probability distribution that also is not neural network. It actually looks like a neural network, but it's not a neural network. Okay, we look at those things too, and for all of them, as well as the neural networks, there is this common idea of machine learning, and generalization in machine learning, and what are the requirements. And we started talking about this at the time when we shifted from reinforcement learning into lifted reinforcement learning. Remember the compression versus generalization discussion, bias, variance, trade-off? We will revisit them today. And we will get your intuitions about what should and should not be taken into consideration when you when you say you're solving a generalization problem. Okay, and then that will get connected to answering the question of when do I start gradient descent. It also answers a whole bunch of other questions such as how big should my network be, how long should I run it, all these things. Okay. So in particular, the answer is related to at least these two points. What is the goal of generalization learning? What do you mean when you say, I'm trying to generalize? You can, of course, overgeneralize. You can also undergeneralize. What exactly is a formal way of defining what is a good learner supposed to do? OK, we need to understand that. And then, of course, the second question we need to understand is, how do we even evaluate generalization learning? As we talk about that, keep in the back of your head that when you take tests in any class, including my class, you are training yourself on some problems. And you're being tested on some problems. <coughs> you would like the problems that will come in the exam to have been sent to you the night before so that you can memorize them, maybe write it on the cheat sheet, so that you can quickly write it onto the exam sheet. But that's not considered learning. Right? So you do know that the exam test questions are a bit different from the ones that were given before. And you have a sense of what is a fair test versus what is an unfair test. You are going to be using those intuitions while we are talking about formal definitions, because in fact, they are all well connected. Okay? Um, so first question is, what is generalization trying to accomplish? Let's look at this. Um, imagine, so you consider any classification problem. Okay, any classification problem. You could have considered, is it a cat or not? I will, make, to make my life simple, I will consider a binary classification problem. Is it a cat or not? Or is it a fraudulent credit card transaction or not? Okay, um, so let's just think in terms of fraudulent credit card transactions for now. So the idea is, Imagine there's a huge big bucket of all possible credit card transactions. Okay? There's this huge big bucket. And then I take some number of transactions from this bucket, sample them, pick them up. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is the way I pick them up is called sampling. This is all basically the basis of learning is statistics. So ultimately, we'll have to talk about things like sampling and distribution. OK. Um, so I'm going to sample these credit card transactions. Some of them I'll pick up. And for them, I'll give them, I'll say, that's the training set. And for this training set, for this training set, I will also tell you whether the, trans the transaction is fraudulent or not. You see what I'm saying? So the transactions are described in terms of some features x1 to xn, and the last feature y, which is, is it fraud or not? You see what I'm saying? And I picked a whole bunch of transactions, 
and um, and then for the ones that I picked, uh, I put as a training set. I also told you what whether or not they are fraudulent transactions. So I gave you this as the label, right? Now remember that when I'm giving the label, you know you assume that the teachers know everything, but teachers make mistakes. Okay, so I could have been labeling them incorrectly sometimes. I could have been labeling them incorrectly. Okay, so hopefully I mostly correctly labeled the transactions, but there may have been a few false positives and a few false negatives. A false positive will be a transaction that is actually not fraudulent, but you say it is fraudulent transaction. It happened to me, I believe, yesterday. You know, I transferred a bunch of money from an account to another account, and my bank, Chase, basically canceled the transaction, sent me a mail saying, we cancel the transaction because it looks suspicious, and uh, you have to call this number. So I call this number, and, and then basically I try to go into my account. My account is locked because it's fraudulent, and you know, Rao can't be trusted about his own money, which is probably true. My, my wife definitely believes that. But <laughs> But the point, of course, is that the, 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 the account was closed. So I called the number. The usual thing this happens. Every once in a while, it happens. If you actually have credit cards, there will be fraudulent transactions. They will call you. They will put, you know, they will lock the thing, and they will call you. So, they, so I called them, and I talked to this guy for a long time. Um, and basically, that guy said, yeah, it's all good. And I gave all the evidence. He said, OK, now you go down to a real Chase bank with two pieces of uh, your identification so that they can kind of touch and feel you and make sure that you are here, have the rawness in you. And then we will open the account. That was me being false positive. It was damn inconvenient. I don't want to lose money, but really if I was somewhere in India and I was on travel, I had to come to Chase Bank in Tepi to be able to you know, show this to them. But so false positives have costs. Right? But anyway, so training example, there may have been a false positive. Similarly, there may have been a false negative. There may have actually have been a fraudulent transaction that they didn't describe as a fraudulent They didn't label as a fraudulent transaction. Yes? Is it always optimal to have zero noise? Optimal to have zero noise. Well, if in fact, if you have an ideal teacher and the teacher knows what they're doing, yes. If you have a bozo teacher, sometimes their mistakes are actually the right things. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Okay. So if your teacher knows what the teacher is saying, yes, if they don't make any noise, it don't arrest that people. Okay. So this is a training set with some district. So the way when I said I put my hand picked up, I put my hand picked up, right? Really, the way you formalize this mathematically is that there is a probabilistic distribution over these transactions. And you can dis sample a distribution. You can sample a distribution. So when you sample a distribution, the things which have higher probability will get sampled more often. The things which have lower probability will get sampled less often. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so I sample them with probability distribution P, and then I put them in, you know, in, in this place here called the training set. They came from here. Then I have a learner. It could be a neural network, or a decision tree, or a Bayesian network, etc. Some learner. Then it basically what it tried to do is come up with a function, some hypothesis, which tries to fit to these training examples such that that function tells you, if you give the description of the training example, then it will tell you whether or not it is its, its class. And this function is such that it makes the least amount of error on the training set. OK? And so it basically winds up sort of predicting the training set at least as close to what the training set says are the labels as possible. And at this point, then you are going to test this learner on a test set. On a test set. Now where did the test set come from? It came from the same way with some distribution P dash 
we draw some more transactions from the bucket, present it to the learner, and say, have a go at it. Try to predict them correctly. When you are actually testing the network, even for this particular test set, you happen to know the true labels. So you know what is called the ground truth. When the network, when the learner is being used in the wild, nobody knows what the ground truth is. The ground truth is what the network says the ground truth is. So before you put it into the wild, you want to make sure that it is doing something right according to your testing. Right? That's what you do. So the interesting thing you notice is I picked up the, the training list data with some distribution P from this big bucket, and then I picked up test data with some other distribution P dash from the same big bucket, and then I'll essentially see how many of them has it correctly, has it correctly uh, labeled. What percentage has it correctly labeled? So the, error, the accuracy would be the percentage of the samples it correctly labeled. And it's because you happen to know the ground truth. OK? So that brings us to the question, what is a fair test set? What is a fair test set? Is any test set as good as any other test set? Or what is a fair test set? You realize that I could do this irrespective of how I got the test set. Basically, I just pick up some you know, a distribution P dash, and then use that to sample the data, and then present it to my learner. I happen to also know their labels, and then, OK? So before we give some formal definition, let's look at this. This was the test from the class that you anonymously voted as to on this particular poll. And the questions were set in such, my, my questions basically in the poll was, which of this is what you believe? Okay. The exam was fair, I did well, the exam was fair, but I struggled. The exam was unfair, but I did all right. The exam was unfair, but I did badly. Blah, blah, blah. You did this. You had, it was a fully anonymous test, fully anonymous poll. Why is it that 67% of you thought it was a fair test. We are actually grading it. Suffice it to say, the average is not 90%. You see what I'm saying? Why did you think it's a fair test? You didn't have to make me happy because you, I didn't even know who was voting. Yes. Yeah, very close, yes. Possibly, but yes. There were some big bucket of intro to AI questions. Right? Some, I sampled them and gave them to you in terms of describing those problems in class as well as in homeworks. And I also sampled them and gave some of them as your test. To the extent you thought it is fair, it is because you believed that the distribution with which you were trained was more or less similar to the distribution with which you were tested. You didn't decide that if I didn't do well on the test, it must be unfair. Or that if I did well on the test, it must have been fair. You didn't do that because that's why I gave so many different options. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's ultimately the notion of fair test. As an example, um, 
So my wife tells me the story that when she was, uh, she's a professor at electrical engineering department, and um, when she took an algorithm course at Maryland, um, this professor essentially spent the entire semester talking about tractable algorithms, and the last one week, just last one week, maybe even less than last one week, talking about the theory of NP-completeness and how to prove that some problems are NP-complete. And then the entire test was prove this to be NP complete, prove this not to be NP complete. In my wife is a professor. You know, professors means we have done well in tests. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been professors. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And still, she remembers this as like the most unfair test to the extent that there was a classmate of hers in that particular class called Professor Shaubai's son, who is actually a professor in Duke Computer Science Department. And many, many years later, uh, but still before now, they once met somewhere, and they said hello to each other, and in about three minutes later, they were talking about, can you believe that stupid test? That, 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 that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what an unfair test feels like. It also shows that professors have nothing else to remember like uh, other than tests. <laughs> That's what an unfair test is like. So now you actually describe what unfair test is supposed to be, which is the training and test samples are derived with the same distribution. If they are not, it's not even a learning problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in fact, you came to the midterm, then I gave you a networks exam. It's a test. <laughs> You'll get some points, but it doesn't have any connection. It's not a learning problem. Learner has a hope even only when the training and test distributions are the same. And that case, even under that case, some learners are good learners, some learners are bad learners. Not bad in a, in a judgmental way. Some are slower learners, uh, some are faster learners, some require a lot more examples to learn the concept, some require fewer examples to learn the con concept. Some, how many hour examples you give them, they will learn, they will never learn the concept. Perceptron, imagine giving Perceptron 10 million examples of NAR gate, I mean, uh, XR gate. It won't learn the concept. Its brain is too small. Okay, so that is when you wind up talking about the differences in learners. So distribution assumptions are training and test data. It's basically learning is feasible only under the assumption that the training and test samples are taken from the same distribution. Now this is not always true in the real world. Like my wife was given an exam which was not a fair test. Okay, similarly you may well have trained your learner to figure out the gender, let's say, of a person using all the all the photographs that you have um, around you. Like maybe go, you ask Google, show me some pictures, and then you train using them as the training data, and you can tell whether or not it's a 